Welcome everyone to this uh, special stream talking about the Eventide campaign. Hello there, I am Jason Bullman. I am the director of game design at Paizo. I am the creator of the Pathfinder role-playing game. And uh, today I am happy to announce that I am also making my own campaign setting. Eventide has been a project that I've been working on for a long time now. It's taken a number of different forms. We'll kind of talk a bit about that later, but tonight, what I'd like to do is give everyone kind of a broad strokes overview of the, the world, um, give everyone a sense of what the uh, campaign is about and the Patreon that is supporting it. I want to talk a bit with all of you about the schedule uh, that is going from this point forward and how we are going to be, how I'm going to be sharing this world with all of you. And uh, last but not least, I want to show off uh, a little bit. I want to talk, maybe just give a teaser, a, the smallest hint about the introductory adventurer called Wolfren's Fate. Um, so today, tonight, we're going to be talking about a lot of things. I got some stuff to show off. I'm glad you've uh, decided to stop by and tune in. We got a lot to go through. So let's get started here. Uh, what is Eventide all about? What What is this? What is this? Well, first of all, Eventide is a campaign setting created specifically to utilize all the rules and features of Pathfinder 2nd Edition. But it's much more than that. It's a world uh, that is uh, very special. It's a world where magic is in the decline. 900 years ago in the world of Eventide, a storm of darkness settled upon the lands, and for three weeks the sun did not rise. Many died in the darkness and shadows. They thought it was the end of the world. But after three weeks, storms lifted, the sun returned. And from the ruins, people began to rebuild. They thought it was a fluke. They thought it was a strange accident. They certainly came to realize that it was not the end of the world because those dark days, which became known as eventide, they were not the end of the world. They were the start of something worse. Eventide was the moment at which magic began to bleed from this world. Those with close ties to nature felt it first. Within a handful of years, all of the Fae vanished from the world. Gone. Nobody knows where. At the same time, druids lost their ability to speak with nature. The natural world just stopped answering their call. Other spellcasters began to feel the same effects too over the years. Wizards began to notice that it was harder and harder to cast some of their spells. Clerics, once venerating an entire pantheon of deities, suddenly began to notice that some of the lesser deities began to fall silent. In the world of Eventide, each deity is represented by a constellation in the skies, and even their stars began to go out sky growing dimmer and darker with each passing night. Now only a handful of deities remain, theirs being the brightest of constellations, but now they're down to just... In the past 900 years, a lot of things have changed. Elves and dwarves once ruled the continent of Alnir, Alnir being the place where our uh, initial focus of exploration kind of centered. Elves and dwarves once ruled over this continent. They were the first to kind of settle these lands. And after a lengthy war, they ruled mostly in peace with one another. But after Eventide, something changed. The elves' birth rate crashed. They weren't having children anymore. Soon their cities stood empty, abandoned, as they gathered in smaller and smaller homes. Dwarves didn't face a similar fate. They had a different problem. Their elders began to feel an ancestral longing to return back to the deep roots beneath the world. And one by one, the Elven Society vanished. Or the Dwarven Society vanished, sorry. The, the Dwarves are still around, the Elves are still around, they're not completely gone. But they are significantly less in number. Same could not be said for Gnomes. They vanished entirely from some four or five hundred years. Let's see. Even tied as a changed world. Humans, who were relatively new to the continent at the time of Eventide, uh, their population exploded. Uh, and at once, at one point in time, they lived just in the margins of society between the elves and the dwarves. 
um, carving out small spaces for themselves. But with the elves and the dwarves collapsing, the human population exploded and they took over the vast center of the continent. One great human kingdom called Zankar took over. And now the Imperium, as it, as it has come to be known, uh, has taken over the vast interior of the continent of Almir. Our story begins in the northern reaches of Alnir, in the Free States, outside of the Zankar Imperium. There's an entire band uh, of territory on the north of Alnir between the Siren Sea to the west uh, and the Great Valmar Ocean to the east. There is a uh, band of land. On one end, there's the great port city of Varnathus, uh, fueled and kept warm even in the coldest winter by the hot springs on which it fits. To the far east is the port town of Tusk Town, where the great, the great hunters uh, trade in ivory and pelts and faraway travelers. But in the center, there's a great valley called the Iskar Valley, and in that valley, there's a town called Wormbone. And Wormbone is the exact focus of our adventure. That is, in fact, where we will be starting now. Uh, to, to, I've, I've talked plenty here, but let me show you a few things here. I've prepared something really special. Uh, I've been doing a lot of maps here because I've been needing to map the continent. I start off with really loose sketch maps and I refine those and refine those and refine those. And I've created a little video kind of showing uh, a little bit about that. And I want to show it all to you right now. So that's still a work in progress, but I am very excited about the direction it is taking, showing kind of the continental map, which is coming along nicely, uh, as well as the more detailed map of the Ice Scar Valley. All of this and more will be made uh, part of the Patreon, which I'm going to talk about soon. So uh, that's the kind of setting, the town of Wormbone. This is a frontier uh, 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 community, fiercely independent. On the fringes outside of the Zankar Imperium, trying to stay out of Imperium control. It's a place where folks go to avoid giant authority, where magic is still not entirely unheard of, unlike in Zankar, where it is mostly outlawed. The town of Wormbone uh, was an old elven settlement. It used to uh, be in this valley. It was it, under a different name in those days. It was called Ilsanvenir. Ilsanvenir was a small elven community, mostly a resort for elven nobles to visit in the summer months when it got too hot down in the south. Ilsanvenir fell uh, after eventide. The, the small community suffered horribly in those dark, dark days. And as a result, in the ensuing years, the town slowly emptied. Well, all that changed a few hundred years ago when humans first returned to this valley. They settled Ilsanvenir, and at the time, they settled right in the Old Elven Ruins, and they called the place Elf End. Not because they had any great imagination. Uh, and the uh, humans that settled there uh, had a good number of years. The town grew in size, eventually outgrowing the Elven Ruins, beginning to spread further and further out into the uh, surrounding environment. This place was always attractive because of the gem wood to the north. This great uh, wooded area filled with rare and valuable woods, but in particular, it is known for one incredibly valuable type of wood, the gemwood tree, uh, which is a uh, very large, very old tree that pulls up minerals through its roots and deposits those inside of its own uh, trunk as these clusters of gems, uh, making the trees incredibly valuable to those who know how to find them. In Elf End had a good run until the dragon came. This was only a few hundred years ago. A dragon came uh, flying down from the north. Uh, the great beast centered in on the town and began 
lighting the place aflame. Hundreds died in the fires, and much of the town was burned in ash. However, no one managed to defeat the beast. They didn't manage to slay it. Instead, the beast landed atop an old crumbling tower, the Tower of uh, Wolfrin, the wizard, the wizard Wolfrin. The dragon landed on his tower, let out a mournful roar, tearing at the, the, the stones, and then suddenly collapsed. Body draped over the tower. In the, in the following days, its flesh rotted from its bones, and leaving its skeleton draped over the tower, and the townsfolk quickly came to realize that they couldn't move the bones at all. The tower had collapsed, the bones were draped over it, locked in place forever, and the name of the town was forever changed. In the years following, it became known as Wormbone. And that is the start of our adventure. Everyone who's going to be playing in this adventure who starts with the introductory adventurer is going to be a adventurer in the town of Wormbone. Adventurers have a special role in uh, Eventide. Generally speaking, the common folk don't really trust adventurers. It's seen as incredibly dangerous, deadly work where you go delve into the dark, horrible places of the world, risking your life for a handful of coins. And most people think they're, they're reckless at best uh, and outright dangerous to so you will be playing an adventure, uh, and uh, there's some special opportunities uh, in store for you. I want to talk more about that here a little later. Next up, I want to talk about what makes uh, Eventide itself, as a campaign, uh, special. What what makes this different than just any other any other campaign setting? Well, one thing that's special is that Eventide really takes advantage of the Pathfinder Tools engine, the way that magic works, how it's divided into four different traditions. That is central and pivotal to the world of Eventide. The way that rarity is a, uh, a scheme that allows the GM to control various levers, that is really important in Eventide. As I mentioned before, there are some things that are not in the setting of Eventide. There are no druids. Druids are mostly just a myth these days. They, people theorize that they might still exist, but no one's seen one in centuries. Gnomes, likewise, gone from the world. Anything that had a very strong connection to nature seems to be gone. At the same time, anything with strong ties to arcane or divine magic is really struggling. Those uh, uh, traditions of magic are having a harder and harder time relying on their spells. Some things that used to be common are now not as common. Summoning, in particular, doesn't work very well in the world. Teleportation and planar magic doesn't work well in the world. So <clears throat> that's one way that even Titan utilizes the rules of Pathfinder 2nd Edition to kind of create a new and interesting campaign experience. Now, don't think I'm just taking stuff away. I'm adding stuff too. Eventide has some new things for you to play with. In particular, there is a brand new ancestry called the Gloamling, Gloamlings are only about three feet tall. They're hairless. They have kind of large, large heads, pointed ears. Um, they are very pale. Uh, their skin ranges anywhere from gray to uh, pales, pale blues and pale purples. Um, they have very large eyes that are gray. They are entirely, they have no ability to see color. Um, and uh, they're very sneaky, adept at uh, living in the shadows. They are um, a quiet people. They're relatively new. Um, they they have not been in the world of Eventide for very long. The first of them only appeared a few hundred years ago. And unlike some of the other ancestries in the world, they have no real history beyond that point. If you ask a Gloamling where their, their people came from, they don't have an answer. But that's Gloamlings. Gloamlings are really interesting. I'm, I'm looking forward to you all being able to learn more about them here in the coming days, in fact. And I'll get to that here. In. Uh, there's also a brand new class in Eventide. The Penumbrist. This class is a spellcaster who is incredibly adept at weaving and pulling together shadows to do their bidding. So the Penumbrist uh, is an occult spellcaster. They're a full spellcasting class. They, they get their, their full allotment of spells. Um, they get focus spells. They get to choose what type of shadow speaks to them. 
Uh, there are a number of different kinds, and each one gives different kind of powers. So the Penumbrist is uh, still in it's in its late stages of design, but I'm looking forward to releasing that uh, to folks who support this campaign here in the coming weeks. We're looking forward. So uh, there's a lot more than that. There are new ancestry feats. There are new spells. There's going to be new magic items. There are uh, a whole bunch of new rules for you to play with uh, to make the world of Eventide kind of come together. Uh, so, you know, things like uh, the fact that, that um, uh, goblins are swamp dwelling uh, in, in Eventide. In fact, their largest city is called Crown Bog in the south of Alnir. And uh, it is in the center of a vast swamp, and this is like the fourth or fifth crown bog. They keep rebuilding it after it falls down. Uh, but uh, uh, they are all swamp dwellers, so as a, as a result, uh, they can take an ancestry feat that allows them to move easier in swampy terrain. They have a swamp foot, basically. Uh, the goblins in Eventide also have no nose. They have no sense of smell. Uh, so that, uh, that, that explains why they enjoy living in the noxious, stinky swamp. Uh, but there's there's that. There's so much more, right? Uh, the, the dwarves have new feats, elves have new feats. There are new feats for a good number of the classes to give them kind of new toys and things to play with that match and fit into the world as well. So what is this all about? How am I going to go about this? Where does it go from here? So let's talk a little bit about that. Eventide is starting out as a very tight focus. What we're going to do is we're going to start out by exploring Wormbone, and the Ice Scar Valley. I'm gonna give you a big picture sense of the world because I want you to understand the context for all of these things, how they relate to neighbors, how they relate to faraway lands. Of course, all of that's really important, but the focus is going to be on Wormbone and the Ice Scar Valley. I wanna start out somewhere close, somewhere tight that I can explore all the locations and give them all to you as well. If all of this goes according to plan, we'll move on. We'll explore the port city of Varnathus wheel uh, and its magical academies and, and creepy steam tunnels underneath. Maybe eventually we'll even get to doing a giant gazetteer about the Zankar Imperium itself and how they are strangely draconian and restrictive but also trying to make good lives for their people. They're good and bad. Uh, but they are really kind of interesting and fun to look at. So over time if uh, this project goes well and is well supported, I'm going to continue exploring this world. And I hope you will come along with me. So I, uh, the plan is to start small and work our way out. I don't want to dump the entire campaign on everyone all at once, but it is a good place to get going. Now, as I mentioned, all of this is being supported um, through Patreon. Uh, that is the best way for me to support this project. And the way it's going to work is starting... Uh, next month, the Patreon is live now, uh, but it won't be charging until April 1st. And I'm not asking people to pay when they sign up. That is an option on Patreon. I'm not doing that right now because I want you to be able to sign up kind of risk-free and check things out because there is a wealth of information out there for you already. But before we get to that, I do want to talk about the Patreon specifically and the various levels and how you can support it. So Patreon, what it's going to allow me to do is share the content with all of you as I'm creating it, as I am working to uh, generate the stories, to create new locations. And all of this that I'm putting together right now is just the starting point. I'm going to continue adding to it and building on it and play testing the introductory adventure with not one, but two different groups of players. Um, I am looking forward to kind of letting them explore the world adding their stories to the world of Eventide. And uh, who knows, I might even work with some of all of you to add some elements from your stories to the world, if that is something you are interested in. So uh, there are currently four levels of support, and we're going to talk about the first three here real quick. Uh, the first uh, uh, way you can support it is with the Adventurer tier. This is just a buck a month and it allows you to access all the posts for the campaign and kind of see what is happening. You don't have access to the website with this with this level. You don't have access to the full campaign, but you will see all of my Patreon posts and get updates on the game. Uh, it's a good way to just throw a bucket and say that you think it's cool um, and uh, that every little bit will help. The 
two primary sponsorship levels are the scholar level and the master level. And the scholar level is for those of you who just want to get kind of the finished stuff and check this out. Right, so it's only five bucks a month, but it does give you access to the entire post archive. It gives you access to all of the pages uh, on minotaurgames.com that contain a wealth of information in the world. It will give you uh, access to my private uh, streams uh, that are going to be talking about the adventure, both in setup and wrap up that I'm going to be doing every week. I'm going to talk about that here in the scheduling bit. Uh, and it will give you a 50% discount on any eventual PDFs that get released. That's five bucks a month. For 10 bucks a month, you jump up to kind of the next tier. You get all the PDFs for free. You get everything from the previous one, but all the PDFs are free. And you get access to uh, twice a month additional kind of secrets and planning streams where I kind of do some Q&As and chat with folks and talk to them about their experiences and kind of talk about where the story is going, where my world building is focused. It's much more behind the scenes. For those of you who want to see how I work, this is the tier for you because it's really going to show kind of a lot of the behind the scenes pieces and uh, how a campaign like this gets put together. Um, so there's going to be some behind the scenes content. There's going to be a lot of work in progress documents will get sent to the uh, uh, masters so they'll get to see kind of some of the pieces before they're ready for prime time. Uh, they'll get rough drafts. As a matter of fact, they're going to get a rough draft of the player documents uh, here in the coming weeks, uh, well before the campaign even fully gets up. Now, there is one more tier on top of this. I don't have it in the graphic behind me here. And that is a $25 a month tier. That comes with two extra benefits. One, uh, it allows you to have access to a uh, special board on my Discord that is specifically a place where you can talk to me directly and I will answer your questions. Um, and once a month, you earn a hundred word credit of my time. So if you are, uh, and I believe that's called the Lord, the Eventide Lord tier. If you are a Lord tier, every month that you support, I will add a hundred word credit to your account to write material specifically for you for the Eventide setting. You don't get the right to publish it, but I will make it to your specifications. And if it fits what I think is cool for the world, I will add it to the world of Eventide. So that's a pretty fun opportunity. I think I'm gonna cap that at only 20 slots. That way I don't have to write more than a couple thousand words a month, uh, but those credits do build up. So every month that you stay in, if you want a bigger piece of content, a hundred words is really only about a spell or a feat, maybe a maybe a magic. That's not a lot. If you want something meteor, you'd have to support for a while. You need. All right, so that is the Patreon support levels. Now, where's this money gonna go? Art. <laughs> art is where it's gonna go. Uh, I am looking forward to getting some beautiful, beautiful art. I have already gotten some art for this project in the past, uh, back in one of its earlier iterations. Uh, I got some rather beautiful art from uh, Lance Red. I wanna show off some of that. This showcases some of the characters from Eventide, uh, and these are certainly uh, worth taking a look at. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's take a look at these. Here we go. So these were some of the characters that were created for the Edge of Eventide, a uh, special campaign uh, within the Eventide setting. This was the first iteration of Eventide, back when it was really just an adventure. And as I began building the adventure, I started to realize, wait, I have a whole world here that is exploring. And it went on from being an adventure to being an entire setting. So these are the characters from the adventure. However, their art shows a lot about the world and it's worth noting. Uh, especially Leilinia over there, she is a special kind of elf from Eventide called a Senazar elf. Uh, the Senazar elves, their features change with the seasons. Um, so this is Leilinia in fall. That is her fall appearance. In winter, her hair would turn pale and blue. Her skin would also equally turn pale, and she would probably start wearing uh, very pale whites and blue clothing. Uh, in spring, it would probably start changing back into greens, and in summer, it would be bright, vibrant colors. So you got a lot here. Uh, you can see there's a halfling, a dwarf, uh, and a handful of humans here, so that's some, that's some good stuff. 
I love those characters. He is, he is a fantastic artist. I have another artist that I'm chatting with right now to start getting some pieces done. I'm about to send them an art order as well. So what does your Patreon money go to? Art. It's very expensive. So uh, I need to get a lot of art to make this the beautiful campaign I know it can be. And you can help me with that by supporting the Patreon. Um, eventually, uh, that money will also go to pay for edit and layout to create PDFs. So really this isn't, uh, this isn't about paying me. I'm enjoying building the world and looking forward to where it goes. This is about making sure that this, this campaign can be everything, uh, I want it. So what's the future look like? So here we are with today is, uh, March 1st, 2022 and going forward from this point, uh, I am going to start doing weekly streams. Those streams are going to happen on YouTube. They will be via a private link sent out to Patreon supporters. So everyone who's a supporter at the $5 tier and above will get access to the once per week stream. Those streams will be on Tuesday at 7 p.m. Pacific time. So right before my normal stream time on Tuesdays. So for those of you who are supporters of the campaign, I will be online for an hour talking about the campaign. For the next four weeks, what I'm going to be doing is talking about the ramp up to the playtest adventure. The playtest adventure is called Wolfren's Fate, and uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a teaser about that here at the end. Um, but that starts, those, those uh, playtest adventures start in early April. So I've got a few weeks to, to ramp up and build up to them. I'll be showing you uh, bits of the plot. I'll be showing you uh, parts of the adventure and it'll culminate in me dropping the first part of the adventure for all of the Patreon supporters to play. That's how this campaign is going to march forward is over the ensuing months, I'll be dropping the adventure to you as I run it. So you can run it as well and give me your feedback. So if you're interested in playing in the world of Eventide, this is your chance. I'm going to be allowing everyone to play test it with me. I'll be taking your feedback and incorporating it and trying to make the final adventure as exciting as it So, and no worries. If you miss it on Tuesdays, there will of course be VOP. I will be posting it up for folks to be able to watch it after we No problem there, no worries. So that'll be every Tuesday for the rest of the month. Starting next month, the playtest itself kicks off with my home groups. Now, the games themselves will not be streamed. I want to be able to play with these folks and have a good time and get their unvarnished feedback without having to worry about all the bells and whistles of running the stream. Uh, however, every week I'm going to do one of two streams. Uh, the, so the first week I'm going to do the setup stream. And in this stream, it's going to be on Tuesday night. I'm going to talk about setting up for the campaign. Uh, I'm going to talk about setting up for that piece of the adventure, what I've prepared, what I've got ready, what I need to make sure I, I memorize and get ready for the game itself. Then between that Tuesday and the next Tuesday, I'm going to run both of my games. On the following Tuesday, I'm going to give the wrap-up stream, talking about what I learned, what the groups did. I'm going to give you some anecdotes from their adventure, and we're going to have a good time talking about it. That process just repeats itself. Every two weeks, a new piece of the adventure drops, new stories about my playthrough, new content will get generated for the site and for uh, all of you to enjoy. So uh, that's going to be the overall process. In addition to that, twice per month on Saturdays at 3 p.m., I'm going to be doing a special stream for the uh, higher tier supporters, talking about the, some of the backgrounds of the world, exploring various bits of Eventide, and uh, kind of talking about where the overall story is going. Because Eventide, at its heart, is a mystery. Something is terribly wrong with the world. Your players may get a sense of what that is. They may even learn a fight again. So that is kind of what I'm excited to get to. Um, and I hope you are too. I've been working on this for a long time. Let me tell you, uh, I, I can't wait to share it with all of you. The project has gone through a lot of iterations over the years. And uh, after a number of fits and stops, I'm finally getting it going. So where do we go from here? That's a, that's a good question. Once this adventure gets going, I, I plan to run it all the way through to its conclusion. This will undoubtedly take several months. If at the end of that time, I think uh, if I have the support and if folks are still excited about it, we'll keep on rolling, doing the next adventure and the next. 
We'll look into building more bits of the world. We'll expand the circle. We'll build bigger rings of world lore and content, making the entire world happen. I'm excited to do it. I I can't wait to kind of share more of this world with you. There are so many fun little details. I, I, there's just so many. They excite me so much. The the, the king of the the halflings. Halflings halflings blow my mind. So halflings. I'm just gonna rant here. Halflings come from an island called Helenanthus, and halflings in Eventide are are very fecund. They have very large families, uh, lots of kids. They usually have multiples. Every time, every time a halfling gives birth, it's usually multiple, multiple children. And uh, as a result, their tiny island is way overpopulated. There's way too many halflings on it. And uh, they're a seafaring people, though. So, you know, they, they spread out and they, they go to different places. And a very large uh, fleet of, of halfling boats came to Ulnir some centuries ago. And they crashed <laughs> after a terrible storm on, on the coast of Ulnir. And there they founded the city of Belcrash. And Belcrash is ruled over by a king, a halfling king. But by halfling tradition, kings of the halflings, their feet must always touch the sands of Helenanthus. So the halfling king in Belcrash wears giant boots filled with sand, <laughs> imported directly from Helenanthus, so that his feet may always touch the sands of Helenanthus. Little details like that fill me with 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 joy i hope they they do for you as well i love that part about uh halflings it, it, it's something that's been in the campaign since almost the very beginning and uh it's one of my favorite little details so there's there's so much to explore there's so much to learn and the great part is so much of it is already up because i'm going to be sharing this campaign with all of you and i'm already starting to do that so it's not just PDFs, it's not just streams. You also, with your Patreon support, gain access to minotaurgames.com. And I wanna show this to you because uh, it's worth kind of exploring if you haven't been there before. This is the uh, uh, front page of uh, minotaurgames.com, so I'm gonna show this to you here. Uh, and, you know, pretty straightforward, relatively uh, straightforward uh, WordPress site here. Uh, but uh, you'll notice up here there is an Eventide tab. And if you go to the Eventide tab, this first page here is open to everybody. And uh, the first page here covers uh, some of the basics about the world. It gives you a bit of the story and uh, then goes into some of the resources. It also then uh, talks a little bit about the old campaign edge of Eventide. But in here, you can access, and much of this is built already, the player's archive. So if you click on the player's archive here, it's going to take you to the player's archive page. And this is kind of your initial directory for uh, a bunch of the lore and information that players need to play characters in the world, even tied. Some of these pages are built. Some of them are still in process. You'll notice a lot of the character options are not yet built. So uh, those aren't quite ready yet. Uh, those should be coming online in the next week or two. Uh, however, all of these World Lord pages are already built. So if you go here and you are a Patreon supporter, you can already read the history of Alnir. It's all right here. This is the player's version of the history of Alnir. It is spoiler free, but it is there to give you a good context of the world. From there, you can go and explore the Ice Scar Valley. And there's plenty here to explore. It goes through locations in the Iscar Valley, has a picture of the map, talks about the history and how it survived Eventide, all of the locations. From there, you can go even deeper and get to the town of Wormbone, which also covers, big surprise, the history and functioning of the town, including all of its major districts, and it talks about a bunch of the major businesses. No map here yet. I'm still working on it. It's still in sketch mode, but that should be up uh, as soon as I have it completed. But that's not all! Life in Eventide kind of goes through all of the things that a character would need to know. Bits about this, the uh, write-ups on the deities. So you get a, an idea of the deities. Their Pathfinder 2 rules uh, will be in the player options. Those, are, those will be up uh, in the next week or so. Uh, talks about the calendar, festivals, holidays. Goes into the various languages of Eventide and how they work everything you need and in character options you can see i've already started building things in here uh you've got uh, bits on character creation some changes to some obvious rarity things mentioning that like druids are rare gnomes are rare because they do not exist in the world 
um, but also begins talking about some of the new options. This will eventually also have a complete navigation to get you to things like Ancestry, which is also in here already. Those dwarven feats I mentioned, there they are. They're there for you to look at right now. So this, this material is still being built, but I am excited to share it with all of you as it comes together. I think there's a lot of really exciting stuff in there. You can go read that right now. If you're a Patreon supporter, it's already unlocked to you. So uh, there's going to be more and more added to that as we go on. Of course, I'm going to continue revising those. There's an entire second half to this that I haven't really gotten started on yet, and that is the GM section of it. It's going to contain secrets and stories and adventure hooks. Almost every location that you saw in those gazetteers, and a handful that you didn't see, um, have adventure hooks, and all of those are going to be on the GM side of things. All that material's written, I just got to get it coded and put up, which is time consuming, but we're getting there. Uh, so I'm super excited to share that with all of you. The $5 uh, backers get access to that as well. The $10 backers will get access to that, both on that and as a art free uh, PDF for ease of use sharing. So. There you go. That's what the Patreon gets you. There's there's a lot there already. There's a lot more to come. There's so much fun to play with in this world. I can't wait to share more of it with all of you. All right. I've been talking for quite a bit here. Before we uh, get to maybe a little bit of Q&A, um, so for those of you who have some questions, get those ready. Uh, I'll, I'll pop up a, a window over here uh, so that folks can chat. Uh, but I do want to tell you just a little bit about the adventure. So, Warmbone. The center of uh, Warmbone is a, is a district called Black Arch. Black Arch is so named because that was the site of the original elven settlement of Ilsanvenir. And when the first settlers came, they built in Black Arch. They built a wall around Black Arch. It wasn't called Black Arch then. Uh, and they clustered in that area and it became kind of really overbuilt. It's kind of, uh, if you've ever seen pictures of like York in England, the, 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 the humbles, uh, the, the area where the buildings are all very close together, they all have overhangs and you're in these kind of tight twisted streets. That's black arches and shambles. That's it. Uh, the, that's black arches. And Black Arches is where old Wizard Wolfren had his tower. So when the dragon came to Elfend, that time called Elfend, and swooped around the town burning it, he landed on Wolfren's tower, and that is where he died, and his bones have remained to this day. As I mentioned, they quickly came to realize that they couldn't remove the bones, which was a real problem because the bones were blocking the entrance to Wolfren's tower. The dragon's arm and wings were kind of draped over the, the collapsed remains of the tower. And as a result, they can't open the front door. No one can get inside. And Wolfren has not been seen since. The townsfolk in the years since have assumed that Wolfren just died, that he was inside the tower and died during the collapse. A powerful wizard of his caliber could have easily gotten out, but no one has seen him since. As a result, the old wizard Wolfram's Tower has become kind of a tourist destination. The number of businesses around there that uh, apply uh, to tourists who have come to visit the tower and view the dragon's skeleton. Dragons are a rare thing these days. Most of them have long since disappeared from the world, tied to magic as they are. Many magical creatures have gone. Dragons were among them. They still exist. At least people think they do. But the dragon's skeleton in Wormbone is a particularly common tourist destination. And that happens to be the location of our adventure. Because the uh, uh, introductory adventurer called Wolfram's Fate is so named because at the very beginning of the adventure, the dragon's arm finally collapses, opening the way to the wizard. Power. And the adventure rush is on. So that is where everything gets started, is the town suddenly can explore a tower that has been sealed in the center uh, of, its, of its busiest district after several hundred years. And guess what? Your adventurers might just be some of the first people inside. So, that is Wolfren's fate. 
And uh, that is the adventure I'm going to start playtesting in just a little over a month. I'm, I have a good chunk of this adventure written already. I'm looking forward to sharing it with all of you after I get to polish it a bit and make sure that it lines up with every everything as it currently exists. Uh, so I'm excited to do that. And uh, that's where we're at. So that's kind of my spiel. That's the story of Eventide up to this point. Uh, I'm trying to see if I have anything else to show folks. Oh, I do have the... Uh, I do have... This is the Ice Scar Valley map. Here to give everyone a really good look at this. This is the Ice Scar Valley. I have named a bunch of the locations. I'm going to be putting this up on the uh, uh, Minotaur Games website uh, today or tomorrow. Um, I'm going to get this up on the Ice Scar Valley page so that everybody has a map with tags in it so they know what uh, the uh, various locations are. So I figured I'd give everybody here a first look. Pretty exciting. All right. You know what? I've got a few minutes left. I want to keep this to an hour, but I've got about 10 minutes left. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up the chat window here. And if anybody has any questions, you can go ahead and add them to your ch add them to the chat uh, right now. And I will see what I can do about answering them. I'm not going to answer all the secrets, of course. <laughs> but there is some really interesting stuff that's probably worth uh, talking about. Um, many have theorized over the years as to what was the cause of even. Um, there have been a lot of competing theories over the year. No one, no one exactly knows, uh, but there are some who think that it is in some way directly tied to what has happened. And, uh, in particular, there was a scholar, forgotten scholar around that era, who dedicated the rest of his life to studying this phenomenon and supposedly came up with some lengthy treatise about it, but no one's seen a copy of it. Uh, rumors, rumor has it that he sent the only completed copy of his theory to the great library in Golgasa, uh, which is now in the center of the Zankar Imperium, and promptly took his own life. So no one's seen it. Uh, but uh, there is that. So if anybody has any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, we can throw those in uh, right now. So smooth criminal is talking about um, you're close smooth. What you're what you're talking about is the seven truths, and that is in fact the name of the treatise that was created by the scholar uh, that uh, that he sent. Nobody knows what was in it. He only created one copy of this treatise, apparently, supposedly legend has it, and sent it to the great library of Golgasa and then took his own life. So the seven truths. Uh, are not exactly widely known because no one's seen a copy of them. Uh, are there very many versatile heritages around? Are there any new ones coming out? So, um, there aren't any versatile heritages in the document right now. That doesn't mean there won't be any in the future. Um, I will say this. There are a few versatile heritages that, is, that are far less common in the world. Some of the planar scions are not nearly as common in this world because planar travel is a little weird. Um, there will be a section in the GM's guide talking about the planar cosmology. Um, it's not very well known by player characters, which is why it's not in the player information. Um, but the, the basic gist of it is that there are basically four distant realms that surround the, the material plane. And one is the, the home of um, gods and demons and devils and, and outsiders and the other another is the home of the elements and the two of them combined one provides spirit one provides matter uh and they are what powers creation uh and the the soul journey goes through them and then you've also got um uh the the, the realm of uh shadow and negative energy and then the primal realm of life and positive energy. uh and they they work kind of like a series of circles that have overlaps that uh, overlap the world and, and create the world. Uh, oh, do I have background music up? Oh, okay. Yeah, let me bring that down. Just. Um. 
So uh, Juno Sigma asked uh, that elder dwarves sometimes get a longing for their ancestral homes. Uh, and do current dwarves have that happen to them now as they grow older? Yes, they do. Um, player characters are kind of immune to that. Um, kind of. There is actually an ancestry feat in the dwarven uh, write-up that talks about them having a longing to return home. And it allows them to kind of when confused, instead of doing random actions, they instead wander off into dark places. Instead of attacking anyone or doing anything negative, they specifically just kind of wander towards the nearest cave. And as they get older, some even take to sleepwalking. Um, <laughs> so that is a thing. So one of the things I mentioned was that dwarves are, are uncommon now, but they are still common for player characters. Uh, adventurers are a rare breed in this world, and as a result, they kind of comes from all walks of life. So, uncommon in the world, but still common as an adventurer. Smooth Criminal asked how necromancers are doing in this world. They're doing okay. Um, all of all, uh, assuming that they are an arcane or a divine uh, necromancer, they're doing okay. Um, arcane and divine magic both uh, do not function as well uh, in this world anymore. Not without a link. So uh, spellcasters, in particular arcane and divine spellcasters, generally carry a link. Player characters start out with a link for free. Um, but the link is some sort of tie to the essence of magic. So for arcane spellcasters, it's usually a fragment of some old relic or, or powerful magic item that allows them to kind of boost their tie to arcane magic. And as long as they have their link on them and are, are using it as part of the casting, they can cast as normal. If they don't have it, they burn twice as many spell slots to make spells happen. Um, same goes with divine spellcasters, but instead of it being a, a piece of a magic item, it's usually some reliquary or something tied to their, their faith. Um, and their, their deities have started to grow quiet. Um, and both of those spell lists have some weird restrictions on them. Necromancy doesn't have any of the same restrictions on it right now. Um, it, it, it still has the spell slot problem and the, the difficulty casting, but it doesn't have any of the problems that say summoning has. Summoning has real problems, right? In that there is a chance that the summoned creature does not return home at the end of the casting and instead becomes uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> a little risky. <laughs> Um, so glowings are really strange. Most people didn't even realize they were there at first. They're very quiet. They keep to themselves. Um, they tend to form small, isolated communities uh, where they, they, they stay and talk to each other. Um, they prefer very, very dark spaces. Uh, the glowing form of writing is a form of braille that they can do in uh, the dark because they, they have no color vision. Uh, and they, they live mostly in the dark, so they, they can't really text very well. So their, their version of writing is a form of um, Glomlings are very shy. They're very untrusting of tall folk. And as a result, because of their kind of weird appearance, a lot of people don't trust Glomlings. They think that they are strange outsiders who have come here to do mischief. In reality, they're just new and they don't really know their way around. And they tend to form bonds through um, deeds. Um, so if you do nice things for a Glomling, they might start doing nice things back to you. And then all of a sudden the, you are their friend and they will hang out with you. Um, but it's this kind of mutual show of trust that gets a Glomling on your side. Um, so they're, they're very interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing people play Glomlings for the first time. Um, I have yet to see anyone play a Glomling yet. Uh, these were, these were designed, um, about a year or two ago, and, uh, I haven't had a chance to play with them yet. So I'm excited to do that. Their complete write-up is ready. And in fact, I think the Glomling will be added to that ancestry page on minotaurgames.com in the next few days. Um, I just need to code it up and get it up. The, the write-up is done. So I just literally need to finish coding it. I, I may even get to it tonight if I have the energy. We'll see. We'll see. But I'll make sure to make a big post about it when I do. Um, yeah. So Glomlings are really interesting. Uh, I, I think their, their ability boosts are Dex and Int. Um, I think they have a flaw to Charisma. I'd have to double check. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, they're fun. They have uh, their all their heritages are based off. They they tend to have various sorts of physiological differences, like bigger ears, bigger eyes, bigger feet, um, that give them slight advantages. I'm not sure, MKB. So uh, interestingly enough, my players, I've assembled both my groups. They're all uh, getting themselves ready. I'm about to give them the lore dumps and the rule dumps. Uh, that way they can start building characters. That's kind of my next big milestone is in the next week or so. I am going to need to work with them. I'm going to strongly encourage at least one of them in one of the two groups, and they're both uh, five-player groups. I'm going to encourage at least one of them to play a global. And I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to have at least two players in one group uh, fighting over who gets to be a penumbrist. So I'm sure I'll get plenty of feedback. Uh, but yeah, it, it is shaping up that way. And I'm going to be talking about these groups, but I'm generally speaking only going to talk to them, talk to all of you about them by their character names. Uh, I'll let them identify themselves in public if they want, but I'm not going to do that part of the campaign. So, uh, you know, I'll tell stories and interesting anecdotes about the campaign, but we'll, we'll keep it. We'll keep their, their privacy and, um, we'll just talk about them in their characters. That should be a um, what else? Yeah. Uh, you know, so having two groups go through the same adventure at, at once is going to be exciting. Um, it'll be really interesting to see if they start diverging and going in different directions. That might make my life really hard. Um, but we'll see how it goes. I'm actually pretty excited about the, the opportunities of seeing how two groups handle the exact same problem. Um, I think that they are very different groups in terms of their, their kind of overall approach. So should be a lot. All right. Well, it looks like we've got uh, uh, just about all the questions we're going to get. If anybody has any last one, I will toss that in. Uh, but I want to thank you all for uh, going with me on this journey. It's been a long journey. Uh, the, the first time I mentioned Eventide was 2016. Uh, so that's when it was just an adventure, and uh, uh, that went for a while. And then, frankly, kind of stopped because I was working very hard on Pathfinder 2nd Edition and it was a 1st Edition thing. And uh, I was like, God, I'm going to have to convert this to 2nd. I should just stop. So I paused. And then 2nd Edition came out and that fall, I spent the fall doing NaNoWriMo to flesh out the campaign because by then I realized I needed the campaign. And by the end of 2019, I was I had... 60,000 worlds, words of world, world lore and campaign rules built. And I was excited and ready to go. And then uh, 2020 hit. <laughs> and I didn't do anything for most of 2020. Uh, as with the rest of you, I'm sure most of you lost as much motivation as I did. So it kind of sat on my hard drive uh, until uh, mid last year when I started thinking about what I could do to bring it back to life and get it going. And frankly, I think this is probably the best way. It gets me playing. It gets you playing. It gets us all exploring the world together and uh, incentivizes me to actually work on it and build it and not not get distracted by other projects. So it would be a lot of fun. The adventure is starting at first level. Absolutely, it's, a, it's an adventure for first level characters. It's meant to be kind of an introductory game to the setting itself. So it's going to teach you a lot about the setting as you go along going to introduce you to some of those mysteries and maybe even give you clues as to what they're all about. Did something eventful happen in 2020? Nope, nothing at all. All right, that's what we got here tonight, folks. I want to thank you all for tuning in. Next Tuesday, 7 p.m. will be the first Patreon-only stream. It'll be on YouTube. There'll be a link in the Patreon. You won't see me uh, promote it uh, much in other places. I, I will point people at the Patreon. So uh, there is that. I want to thank you all for watching here tonight. I hope you are interested in this campaign. I am certainly excited to bring it to you. Thank you for watching, everybody. Mm -hmm.